Episode 662. Book Talk begins at 7 minutes and 59 seconds. Emma begins with episode 649. Welcome to Craft Lit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 662. Buckle up for baits. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by our lovely patrons and YouTube channel members. This week, we would like to highlight Lindsay Crimplin, Shannon, Carmen Lau, Donna Henderson, and Yinka Jujan. Thank you so much. We could not do this without you. I was doing okay, actually. I really was for uh, several days. And then today... Today just tanked. So for those of you on YouTube, I will probably not be wearing the same clothes tomorrow if I have to come back and record. For those of you who are just listening and not watching, it won't matter. This this is the beauty of what podcasting used to be. So, hi. I've warned you in advance, far in advance. You can run the other way if you need to. Buckle up for baits. We are going to have some baits action in our chapters today. We're going to do chapters 27 and 28, which is volume two, chapters nine and 10. And yeah, it's going to be fun. A couple of things to remind you about when this episode goes live, it will be right before the raffle is over for the month of June, 2024. If you would like to be in the running for the author clock, every minute has a story. Please follow the link in the description to our rafflecopter widget and sign up. It's super easy to do. And you know, you could win something free. Big fun, no whammies. I also wanted to let you know, Tracy is at it once again, and we are going to have our Christmas in July bookmark exchange. Thank you, Tracy. And actually, thank you everybody on the Zoom call last Thursday night. I was not okay. And they made all the plans for me. So thank you. July 28th will be the cutoff. You can sign up now, between now and July 19th, if you want to be able to exchange a bookmark with somebody else. Plan to mail those bookmarks by August 9th, both for international and domestic, and that will be just fine. That means sign up between now and July 19th. And then by July 28th, we will have the name and address of the person that you're switching with. So yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. I really have come to love our bookmark exchanges. And please make sure to let us know if you have an Instagram that people can thank you on or at you on or, you know, whatever social media you're on so that you can be thanked and you know it. That would be awesome. Several of you have asked and the answer is Mildred is doing just fine. I found a really good, it's pretty inexpensive, gelatinous hand degreaser, but it also has lanolin in it. So it's it degreases and protects. So it's it's the kind of thing that my grandfather used to have a big, big bucket of in his garage. He had it on one of those little doohickeys where if you push up on the bottom of the spout, it would dispense a certain amount, like a like a soap dispenser. He had a big can of this stuff. And I always thought it was really cool because it worked like magic. And this is working like magic. So it's cutting all the grease and it's taken up a lot of dirt and it's super, super mild. It's called goop. Not that goop. It's, I'll put a link for you. It's highly recommended by me. So far it has done no damage. So I'm very happy. But yeah, the entire bottom of Mildred is clean now. That means all of the, the metal workings, everything moves, everything does what it's supposed to do. And I'm cleaning off the needle bar and the presser foot bar and all of the hardware that goes along with that. And that and some quadruple aught steel wool and some metal polish and some sewing machine oil. And it's all starting to get clean. So it's looking very pretty. Now, 
the closer I get to having it all clean, though, the more I'm like, I really need to find a treadle table. So that is the hunt that Aiden and I are on currently. But that's fine. Gives us something to do. Well, while I'm on my back, I can sort through local listings for things. Along with Mildred, we have another M word. We have Milady. And as soon as I feel well enough to record it, I will be recording a new review for the Three Musketeers Part Deux Milady movie that just was released in the States. I know it's been released elsewhere for quite a while, but I only just was able to get it on streaming. And as with the the previous Three Musketeers, you know, if you're really a stickler and you only want to see the book done, then just don't watch, at least don't watch this second part. The first one you could probably handle. But if you want to see an excellently constructed revamp of the story, and I don't mean revamp like, oh, we're going to do all modern things in it, and we're going to have modern mores and social values and things like that. It's not that. It's how do you take a book that is that long and turn it into a coherent story? Because as we know, Dumas wrote as he was going. And so there are parts that get kind of windy and convoluted. And maybe he would have gone back and changed some things if he could have. And it was too late. So this movie truncates some things in ways that at first I thought was really odd. But then I found it it all worked so well at the end. It was very satisfying. Even though Ava Green is, again, ridiculously dressed and Abby Cox is going to have a heart, well, she and Bernadette Banner are going to have heart attacks when they see the, the corset Milady is in without a chemise underneath. It just looks uncomfortable, for one thing, but also, can you not make a chemise look sexy, for God's sake, people? You're French. You should be able to do this. Aside from that, it wasn't like the Little Women movie with no bonnets. It's not that bad, but but it was ridiculous. And then wearing the chemise over the corset is the other thing that happens in the movie. So I'm just warning you, if you're a stickler for that, gird thyself. But that aside, Eva Green does some really amazing combat. And again, the people who are involved in this movie are just charming and marvelous. And yeah, I really enjoyed it. I'm going to watch it again before I write up the review. But, but if you can get a hold of it, and you're good with reading subtitles. It's lovely. And so nice to see a French production of that book as a movie. Just made me very happy. All right. So our chapters today, as I said, chapters 27 and 28. The first thing that I want to say before I forget, because I will forget otherwise, is at the very end of our chapters today, Mr. Knightley will show up. When he shows up, as soon as he shows up, he doesn't appear until then, so you won't get confused. When he does show up, listen very closely to the dialogue that is happening, both coming out of his mouth and going into his ears, because it is some of the most dexterous, fancy footwork I have ever come across in any writing as far as the show don't tell. We are getting a hundred percent of characterization and action and all the good stuff just from the dialogue. And most of the action is hilarious. So just, uh, I can't wait. I can't wait to hear what you think about it. I love that part. That aside, two, three, four, five, six, the sixth word in our first chapter today might strike you as kind of appalling. And that word is condescension. We think of condescension, well, I think of condescension in kind of a negative light. If you condescend to do something, it's you're kind of lowering yourself and you're saying, okay, I guess I will. It has a very negative vibe to it. Condescension at this time, at least for a little bit longer, was going to be less appalling. <laughs> There's more of an opportunity for grace involved in this kind of condescending. If I am, as far as society agrees, if I am in a higher class than somebody else, 
and I condescend to spend time with them. It doesn't mean I'm doing it in spite of anything. It doesn't mean I'm doing it to spite anyone. It just isn't descriptive of that social interaction. So it doesn't carry any of the darkness <laughs> that I think it's connected to these days. So just don't let that throw you. There will be other things that will throw you, but that should not be one of them. There's a reference to a bow window, B-O-W dash window. I don't think we use the phrase terribly often in the States, but I know I've heard it referred to elsewhere. A bow window would be like what we consider a bay window here, which has three angles. A bow window is like um, the front of one of the stores in Hogwarts from the movie. It's a rounded window, or it's very Dickensian looking window. I hope that's making sense. That's where my brain is going to as far as remembering images of bow windows before. You will also hear a reference to gingerbread. Gingerbread, very popular. And gingerbread, the recipe goes back a ways, but the one that got famous that I know about because of Diane and our trip to the Lake District back in, was it 2015? I think it was 2015. Grasmere up in the Lake District is famous for its gingerbread. Now, I did find a Grasmere-ish knockoff recipe online that I will link out to, and that one's gluten-free. Most cakes and biscuits can be made, biscuits, cookies, can be made gluten-free without you actually noticing. Like even brownies, shortbread still tastes and the texture is still very good when it's gluten-free. So I was very bummed in 2015 when there was no gluten-free gingerbread, but that's okay because now I can make it myself. And let me tell you, this recipe looks like it's going to be spicy. So if you like some gingerbread, links in the show notes. And yes, that gingerbread was absolutely a thing. In fact, I, re I read a reference. Gingerbread evidently started so long ago that Queen Elizabeth I gave gingerbread men to her courtiers one year, shaped like themselves, which I thought was very clever. So yay, yay for Queen Elizabeth and gingerbread. You are also going to hear a description of Highbury like you've never heard it before. And quite honestly, like I have never heard any other Austinian Bronte era description of a town before. It is not what I expected. I'd completely forgotten that this was in here. It's very cinematic. So the section where you hear the description of the, the town and the bow window and the gingerbread, that's this slice of life street scene that we don't really, at least I can't remember ever coming across. If you've got another example of this from this kind of late 17 into the early 1800s writing, let me know because I'm now I'm really kind of fascinated. It's stuck out. It's lovely. You're going to hear the phrase son-in-law being used again when in fact what we would say is stepson. That's happened before. It's going to happen again. And if somebody catches your eye, the way we use it now is very accidental. Like I wasn't paying attention and then something in my peripheral vision caught my eye and I looked. That is not how it's being used here. How it was being used at the time was very much caught my eye like, hey, hi look over here. I have now caught your eye, which actually does kind of matter as far as intention goes and characterization. So it's something just to be aware of. Not super important, but something to be aware of. You'll hear a reference to a pattern gown. A pattern gown is the one that your dressmaker would have. That's like what we would call a muslin today, but like a demo dress pattern. It's not on paper. It's made out of fabric, but it's basted together so that you could try it on and make sure it still fits you, but so it's in pieces that the dressmaker could then use to cut and make a new dress from. So that's a dress pattern gown. That's all it is. Baked apples. I will also give you a recipe for baked apples. Baked apples are referred to quite a few times in the chapter. What you need to know is really you only need to cook them once. There, I'm done. Just keep that in mind. You really only need to cook them once. The reference goes on and says the baked apples came home. Mrs. Wallace sent them by her boy. This is because bakeries, 
And we know this from A Christmas Carol. Bakeries, when they were done breaking their bread for the day, their ovens were still hot. And so they would often allow you to pay them you know, a few pennies and they would keep your food warm. They would cook something like a turkey or a goose, something big that you don't actually have oven space for. That's one of the services that bakeries were able to provide to the people in town. So the baked apples were actually baked by the baker in the baker's ovens after the bread was done being baked for the day, which I thought was kind of cute. I love that. It's like community and everything. What a concept. You'll hear somebody say, as he said, very nice things. It was no compliment, meaning it wasn't just said out of politeness. It really, it wasn't just a compliment. It was a nice thing to say, sure, but it wasn't just a compliment. Keeping apples were apples that didn't rot very quickly. So useful. Good to have. Some of them apparently would keep until February or March from apple season in the fall all the way to February and March, which is pretty impressive, actually. William Larkins. William Larkins is the steward for Mr. Knightley over at Donwell Abbey. And Mrs. Hodges is the cook at Donwell Abbey. Their names get mentioned in a couple of places, and it's just nice to know that that's who, in fact, they are and that you're not dreaming. Bushels. Bushels of apples. Apparently, at this time, the word bushel didn't have a particularly solid meaning, so it's kind of hard to know how many apples we're talking about. So it, it kind of doesn't matter. Just go with whatever's in your mind, and it'll be fine. It's a lot. It's more than five. We'll stay with that. Probably more than 12. It's enough. And it's making me drool. It sounds really good right now. Oh, apples. All right. In chapter 28, you'll hear about Mrs. Bates being deprived of her usual employment. Because her usual employment would be reading or sewing. So she is not able to do so because her glasses have broken. That is her her employment. If you're like, wait a minute, Mrs. Bates, why would she be employed? She's not employed that way. It's just the things that she does to take up time during her day. There's also a word that I've never seen before. And apparently, according to the OED, it really starts with Jane Austen. Who knew? Deedly. Not deedly, deedly, do, but deedly, like D E E D I L Y. Deedly is an adverb form for actively, like they were working at this deed that they were doing. They were paying attention to it. They were engaged. They were actively involved in whatever the thing was. And I just, I got such a kick out of that. Deedly. Framer. You're going to hear several things about music in our second chapter today. Kramer, Johann Baptist Kramer was a famous pianist and composer and also sheet music publisher. This guy was into diversification way early. So when one of the characters says, here's something quite new to me, do you know it? Kramer. We don't know if that's something Kramer wrote, something Kramer published, or something that Kramer was in fact famous for having played himself. Apparently, like Beethoven thought he was the bee's knees, so he was he was a known factor in the world. There's Kramer, and then there's another song that we will talk about after we listen to today's chapters that relates to that same section where they're talking about music. Casement window. We've talked about this before, I think. Casement windows were just the ones that were hinged so that they could be opened so that you could lean out. And that becomes a plot point in today's chapters. And that's it. That's everything you need. There's some really, if you've already read Emma before, pay close attention to how Frank Churchill says what he says. If you haven't read this book before, don't worry about that. Just enjoy the chapters because they're marvelous. That's, they're just fun today. All right. Here we go with listening to volume two, chapters eight and nine, or chapters 27 and 28 of Jane Austen's Emma. If you are listening to your own version of the book, please fast wind to 47 minutes, 18 seconds. All right, here we go. 
Volume Two, Chapter Nine. Emma did not repent her condescension in going to the Coles. The visit afforded her many pleasant recollections the next day, and all that she might be supposed to have lost on the side of dignified seclusion must be amply repaid in the splendor of popularity. She must have delighted the Coles, worthy people who deserved to be made happy, and left a name behind her that would not soon die away. Perfect happiness, even in memory, is not common, and there were two points on which she was not quite easy. She doubted whether she had not transgressed the duty of woman by woman in betraying her suspicions of Jane Fairfax's feelings to Frank Churchill. It was hardly right, but it had been so strong an idea that it would escape her, and his submission to all that she told was a compliment to her penetration, which made it difficult for her to be quite certain that she ought to have held her tongue. The other circumstance of regret related also to Jane Fairfax, and there she had no doubt. She did unfeignedly and unequivocally regret the inferiority of her own playing and singing. She did most heartily grieve over the idleness of her childhood, and sat down and practised vigorously an hour and a half. She was then interrupted by Harriet's coming in, and if Harriet's praise could have satisfied her, she might soon have been comforted. Oh, if I could but play as well as you and Miss Fairfax! Don't class us together, Harriet. My playing is no more like hers than a lamp is like sunshine. Oh, dear, I think you play the best of the two. I think you play quite as well as she does. I am sure I'd much rather hear you. Everybody last night said how well you played. Those who knew anything about it must have felt the difference. The truth is, Harriet, that my playing is just good enough to be praised, but Jane Fairfax's is much beyond it. Well, I shall always think that you play quite as well as she does, or that if there is any difference nobody would ever find it out. Mr. Cole said how much taste you had, and Mr. Frank Churchill talked a great deal about your taste, and that he valued taste much more than execution. Ah, but Jane Fairfax has them both, Harriet. Are you sure? I saw she had execution, but I did not know she had any taste. Nobody talked about it. And I hate Italian singing. There is no understanding a word of it. Besides, if she does play so very well, you know it is no more than she is obliged to do, because she will have to teach. The Coxes were wondering last night whether she would get into any great family. How did you think the Coxes looked? Just as they always do. Very vulgar. They told me something, said Harriet rather hesitatingly. But it is nothing of any consequence. Emma was obliged to ask what they had told her, though fearful of its producing Mr. Elton. They told me that Mr. Martin dined with them last Saturday. Oh? He came to their father upon some business, and he asked him to stay to dinner. Oh? They talked a great deal about him, especially Anne Cox. I do not know what she meant, but she asked me if I thought I should go and stay there again next summer. She meant to be impertinently curious, just as such an Anne Cox should be. She said he was very agreeable the day he dined there. He sat by her at dinner. Miss Nash thinks either of the Coxes would be very glad to marry him. Very likely. I think they are, without exception, the most vulgar girls in Highbury. Harriet had business at Ford's. Emma thought it most prudent to go with her. Another accidental meeting with the Martins was possible, and in her present state would be dangerous. Harriet, tempted by everything and swayed by half a word, was always very long at a purchase, and while she was still hanging over muslins and changing her mind, Emma went to the door for amusement. Much could not be hoped from the traffic of even the busiest part of Highbury. Mr. Perry walking hastily by, Mr. William Cox letting himself in at the office door, Mr. Cole's carriage-horses returning from exercise, or a stray letter-boy on an obstinate mule, were the liveliest objects she could presume to expect, and when her eyes fell only on the butcher with his tray, a tidy old woman travelling homewards from shop with her full basket, two curs quarrelling over a dirty bone, and a string of dawdling children round the baker's little bow-window eyeing the gingerbread, she knew she had no reason to complain, and was amused enough, quite enough still to stand at the door. A mind lively and at ease can do with seeing nothing, and can see nothing that does not answer. She looked down the Randalls Road. The scene enlarged. Two persons appeared, Mrs. Weston and her son-in-law. They were walking into Highbury, to Hartfield, of course. 
They were stopping, however, in the first place at Mrs. Bates's, whose house was a little nearer Randall's than Ford's, and had all but knocked when Emma caught their eye. Immediately they crossed the road and came forward to her, and the agreeableness of yesterday's engagement seemed to give fresh pleasure to the present meeting. Mrs. Weston informed her that she was going to call on the Bateses, in order to hear the new instrument. "'For my companion tells me,' said she, "'that I absolutely promised Miss Bates last night that I would come this morning. I was not aware of it myself. I did not know that I had fixed a day, but as he says I did, I am going now.' "'And while Mrs. Weston pays her visit, I may be allowed, I hope,' said Frank Churchill, "'to join your party and wait for her at Hartfield, if you are going home.' Mrs. Weston was disappointed. "'I thought you meant to go with me. They would be very much pleased.' "'Me? I should be quite in the way. But perhaps I may be equally in the way here. Miss Woodhouse looks as if she did not want me. My aunt always sends me off when she is shopping. She says I fidget her to death, and Miss Woodhouse looks as if she could almost say the same. What am I to do?' "'I am here on no business of my own,' said Emma. "'I am only waiting for my friend. She will probably have soon done, and then we shall go home. But you had better go with Mrs. Weston and hear the instrument.' "'Well, if you advise it. But,' with a smile, if Colonel Campbell should have employed a careless friend, and if it should prove to have an indifferent tone, what shall I say? I shall be no support to Mrs. Weston. She might do very well by herself. A disagreeable truth would be palatable through her lips, but I am the wretchedest being in the world at a civil falsehood. I do not believe any such thing, replied Emma. I am persuaded that you can be as insincere as your neighbours when it is necessary, but there is no reason to suppose the instrument is indifferent. Quite otherwise, indeed, if I understood Miss Fairfax's opinion last night. Do come with me, said Mrs. Weston. If it be not very disagreeable to you, it need not detain us long. We will go to Hartfield afterwards. We will follow them to Hartfield. I really wish you to call with me. It will be felt so great an attention, and I always thought you meant it. He could say no more, and with the hope of Hartfield to reward him, returned with Mrs. Weston to Mrs. Bates's door. Emma watched them in, and then joined Harriet at the interesting counter, trying with all the force of her own mind to convince her that if she wanted plain muslin it was of no use to look at figured, and that a blue ribbon, be it ever so beautiful, would still never match her yellow pattern. At last it was all settled, even to the destination of the parcel. "'Should I send it to Mrs. Goddard's, ma'am?' asked Mrs. Ford. "'Yes. No. Yes, to Mrs. Goddard's. Only my pattern gown is at Hartfield. No, you shall send it to Hartfield, if you please. But then Mrs. Goddard will want to see it, and I could take the pattern gown home any day. But I shall want the ribbon directly, so it had better go to Hartfield. At least the ribbon. You could make it into two parcels, Mrs. Ford, could not you?' "'It is not worth while, Harriet, to give Mrs. Ford the trouble of two parcels.' "'No more it is.' "'No trouble in the world, ma'am,' said the obliging Mrs. Ford. "'Oh, but indeed, I would much rather have it only in one. Then, if you please, you shall send it all to Mrs. Goddard's. I do not know. No, I think, Miss Woodhouse, I may just as well have it sent to Hartfield, and take it home with me at night. What do you advise?' "'That you do not give another half-second to the subject. To Hartfield, if you please, Mrs. Ford.' "'Ay, that'll be much the best,' said Harriet, quite satisfied. "'I should not at all like it have it sent to Mrs. Goddard's.' Voices approached the shop, or rather one voice and two ladies. Mrs. Weston and Miss Bates met them at the door. "'My dear Miss Woodhouse,' said the latter, "'I am just run across to entreat the favour of you to come and sit down with us a little while, and give us your opinion of our new instrument. You and Miss Smith. How do you do, Miss Smith?' "'Very well, I thank you, and I beg Mrs. Weston to come with me, that I might be sure of succeeding.' "'I hope Mrs. Bates and Miss Fairfax are—' "'Very well. I am much obliged to you. My mother is delightfully well. And Jane caught no cold last night. How is Mr. Woodhouse? I am so glad to hear such good account. Mrs. Weston told me you were here. Oh, then I said, I must run across. I am sure Miss Woodhouse will allow me just to run across and entreat her to come in. My mother will be so very happy to see her. Now we are such a nice party, she cannot refuse. I pray do, said Mr. Frank Churchill. Miss Woodhouse's opinion of the instrument will be worth having. But, said I, I shall be more sure of succeeding if one of you will go with me. 
"'Oh,' said he, "'wait half a minute till I have finished my job. "'For would you believe it, Miss Woodhouse? "'There he is, in the most obliging manner in the world, "'fastening the rivet of my mother's spectacles. "'The rivet came out, you know, this morning. "'So very obliging! "'For my mother had no use of her spectacles, "'could not put them on. "'And by the by, everybody ought to have two pair of spectacles. "'They should indeed. "'Jane said so. "'I meant to take them over to John Saunders the first thing I did, "'but something or other hindered me all the morning. First one thing, then another. "'There is no saying what, you know.' At one time Patty came to say she thought the kitchen chimney wanted sweeping. Oh, said I, Patty, do not come with your bad news to me. Here is the rivet of your mistress's spectacles out. Then the baked apples came home. Mrs. Wallace sent them by her boy. They are extremely civil and obliging to us, the Wallaces, always. I have heard some people say that Mrs. Wallace can be uncivil and give a very rude answer, but we have never known anything but the greatest attention from them. And it cannot be for the value of our custom now, for what is our consumption of bread, you know? Only three of us besides dear Jane at present, and she really eats nothing. Makes such a shocking breakfast. You would be quite frightened if you saw it. I dare not let my mother know how little she eats. So I say one thing, and then I say another, and it passes off. But about the middle of the day she gets hungry, and there is nothing she likes so well as these baked apples, and they are extremely wholesome. For I took the opportunity the other day of asking Mr. Perry. I happened to meet him in the street. Not that I had any doubt before— I have so often heard Mr. Woodhouse recommend baked apple. I believe it is the only way that Mr. Woodhouse thinks the fruit thoroughly wholesome. We have apple dumplings, however, very often. Patty makes an excellent apple dumpling. Well, Mrs. Weston, you have prevailed, I hope, and these ladies will oblige us. Emma would be very happy to wait on Mrs. Bates, etc., and they did at last move out of the shop, with no farther delay from Miss Bates than— "'How do you do, Mrs. Ford? I beg your pardon, I did not see you before. I hear you have a charming collection of new ribbons from town. Jane came back delighted yesterday. Thank ye, the gloves do very well, only a little too large about the wrist, but Jane is taking them in. "'What was I talking of?' said she, beginning again when they were all in the street. Emma wondered on what of all the medley she would fix. "'I declare I cannot recollect what I was talking of.' "'Oh, my mother's spectacles! So very obliging, Mr. Frank Churchill! Oh, said he, I do think I can fasten the rivet. I like a job of this kind excessively, which you know showed him to be so very—indeed, I must say that as much as I had heard of him before and much as I had expected, he very far exceeds anything. I do congratulate you, Mrs. Weston, most warmly. He seems everything the fondest parent could—' "'Oh,' said he, "'I can fasten the rivet. I like a job of that sort excessively.' I never shall forget his manner, and when I brought out the baked apples from the closet, and hoped our friends would be very so much obliging as to take some, oh, said he directly, there is nothing in the way of fruit half so good, and these are the finest-looking home-baked apples I ever saw in my life. That, you know, was so very, and I am sure by his manner it was no compliment. Indeed, they are very delightful apples, and Mrs. Wallace does them full justice. Only we do not have them baked more than twice, and Mr. Woodhouse made us promise to have them done three times. But Miss Woodhouse will be so good as not to mention it. The apples themselves are the very finest sort for baking, beyond a doubt. All from Donwell, some of Mr. Knightley's most liberal supply. He sends us a sack every year, and certainly there never was such a keeping apple anywhere as one of his trees. I believe there is two of them. My mother says the orchard was always famous in her younger days, but I was really quite shocked the other day, for Mr. Knightley called one morning, and Jane was eating these apples, and we talked about them and said how much she enjoyed them, and he asked whether we were not got to the end of our stock. I am sure you must be, said he, and I will send you another supply, for I have a great many more than I can ever use. William Larkins let me keep a larger quantity than usual this year. I will send you some more before they get good for nothing.' So I begged he would not, for really, as to ours being gone, I could not absolutely say that we had a great many left. It was but half a dozen indeed, but they should be all kept for Jane, and I could not at all bear that he should be sending us more, so liberal as he has been already. And Jane said the same, and when he was gone she almost quarrelled with me. No, I should not say quarrelled, for we never had to quarrel in our lives, but she was quite distressed that I had owned the apples were so nearly gone. She wished I had made him believe we had a great many left. "'Oh,' said I, "'my dear, I did say as much as I could.' However, the very same evening William Larkins came over with a large basket of apples, the same sort of apples, a bushel at least, and I was very much obliged, and went down and spoke to William Larkins, and said everything, as you may suppose. William Larkins is such an old acquaintance. I am always glad to see him. But, however, I found afterwards from Patty that William said it was all the apples of that sort his master had. He had brought them all, and now his master had not one left to bake or boil. 
William did not seem to mind it himself. He was so pleased to think his master had sold so many, for William, you know, thinks more of his master's profit than anything. But Mrs. Hodges, he said, was quite displeased at their being all sent away. She could not bear that her master should not be able to have another apple tart this spring. He told Patty this, but bid her not mind it, and be sure not to say anything to us about it. Mrs. Hodges would be cross sometimes, and as long as so very many sacks were sold, it did not signify who ate the remainder. And so Patty told me, and I was excessively shocked indeed. I would not have Mr. Knightley know anything about it for the world. He would be so very—I wanted to keep it from Jane's knowledge, but unluckily I had mentioned it before I was aware. Miss Bates had just done as Patty opened the door, and her visitors walked upstairs without having any regular narration to attend to, pursued only by the sounds of her desultory goodwill. "'Pray take care, Mrs. Weston. There is a step at the turning. Pray take care, Miss Woodhouse. Ours is a rather a dark staircase, rather darker and narrower than one could wish. Miss Smith, pray take care. Miss Woodhouse, I am quite concerned. I am sure you hit your foot. Miss Smith, the step at the turning.' End of chapter 9 Volume 2, Chapter 10 The appearance of the little sitting-room as they entered was tranquillity itself. Mrs. Bates, deprived of her usual employment, slumbering on one side of the fire, Frank Churchill at a table near her, most deedily occupied about her spectacles, and Jane Fairfax standing with her back to them, intent on her pianoforte. Busy as he was, however, the young man was yet able to show a most happy countenance on seeing Emma again. "'This is a pleasure,' said he, in rather a low voice, "'coming at least ten minutes earlier than I had calculated. You find me trying to be useful. Tell me if you think I shall succeed.' "'What?' said Mrs. Weston. "'Have not you finished it yet? You would not earn a very good livelihood as a working silversmith at this rate.' "'I have not been working uninterruptedly,' he replied. "'I have been assisting Miss Fairfax in trying to make her instrument stand steadily. It was not quite firm, an unevenness in the floor, I believe. You see we have been wedging one leg with paper. This was very kind of you to be persuaded to come. I was almost afraid you would be hurrying home.' He contrived that she should be seated by him, and was sufficiently employed in looking out the best baked apple for her, and trying to make her help or advise him in his work, till Jane Fairfax was quite ready to sit down to the pianoforte again. That she was not immediately ready, Emma did suspect to arise from the state of her nerves. She had not yet possessed the instrument long enough to touch it without emotion. She must reason herself into the power of performance— and Emma could not but pity such feelings, whatever their origin, and could not but resolve never to expose them to her neighbour again. At last Jane began, and though the first bars were feebly given, the powers of the instrument were gradually done full justice to. Mrs. Weston had been delighted before, and was delighted again. Emma joined her in all her praise, and the pianoforte, with every proper discrimination, was pronounced to be altogether of the highest promise. "'Whoever Colonel Campbell might employ,' said Frank Churchill, with a smile at Emma, "'the person has not chosen ill. I heard a good deal of Colonel Campbell's taste in Weymouth, and the softness of the upper notes I am sure is exactly what he and all that party would particularly prize. I dare say, Miss Fairfax, that he either gave his friend very minute directions, or wrote to Broadwood himself. Do not you think so?' Jane did not look round. She was not obliged to hear. Mrs. Weston had been speaking to her at the same moment. "'It is not fair,' said Emma in a whisper. "'Mine was a random guess. Do not distress her.' He shook his head with a smile, and looked as if he had very little doubt, and very little mercy. Soon afterwards he began again. "'How much your friends in Ireland must be enjoying your pleasure on this occasion, Miss Fairfax. I dare say they often think of you, and wonder which will be the day, the precise day of the instrument's coming to hand. Do you imagine Colonel Campbell knows the business to be going forward just at this time? Do you imagine it to be the consequence of an immediate commission from him, or that he may have sent only a general direction, an order indefinite as to time, to depend upon contingencies and conveniences? He paused. She could not but hear. She could not avoid answering. "'Till I have a letter from Colonel Campbell,' said she, in a voice of forced calmness, "'I can imagine nothing with any confidence. It must be all conjecture.' "'Conjecture? Ay, sometimes one conjectures right, and sometimes one conjectures wrong. 
I wish I could conjecture how soon I shall make this rivet quite firm. What nonsense one talks, Miss Woodhouse, when hard at work, if one talks at all. Your real workmen, I suppose, hold their tongues. But we gentlemen labourers, if we get hold of a word. Miss Fairfax said something about conjecturing. There it is done. I have the pleasure, madam, to Mrs. Bates, of restoring your spectacles, healed for the present. He was very warmly thanked by both mother and daughter. To escape a little from the latter, he went to the pianoforte, and begged Miss Fairfax, who was still sitting at it, to play something more. "'If you are very kind,' said he, "'it will be one of the waltzes we danced last night. Let me live them over again. You did not enjoy them as I did. You appeared tired the whole time. I believe you were glad we danced no longer, but I would have given worlds.' all the worlds one ever has to give, for another half-hour. She played. What felicity it is to hear a tune again which has made one happy! If I mistake not, that was danced at Weymouth. She looked up at him for a moment, coloured deeply, and played something else. He took some music from a chair near the pianoforte, and turning to Emma, said, Here is something quite new to me. Do you know it? Kramer! And here are a new set of Irish melodies. That, from such a quarter, one might expect. This was all sent with the instrument. Very thoughtful of Colonel Campbell, was it not? He knew Miss Fairfax could have no music here. I honour that part of the attention particularly. It shows it to have been so thoroughly from the heart. Nothing hastily done, nothing incomplete. True affection only could have prompted it. Emma wished he would be less pointed, yet could not help being amused, and when, on glancing her eye towards Jane Fairfax, she caught the remains of a smile, when she saw that with all the deep blush of consciousness there had been a smile of secret delight, she had less scruple in the amusement, and much less compunction with respect to her. This amiable, upright, perfect Jane Fairfax was apparently cherishing very reprehensible feelings. He brought all the music to her, and they looked it over together. Emma took the opportunity of whispering, "'You speak too plain. She must understand you.' "'I hope she does. I would have her understand me. I am not in the least ashamed of my meaning.' "'But really I am half ashamed, and wish I had never taken up the idea.' "'I am very glad you did, and that you communicated it to me. I have now a key to all her odd looks and ways.' Leave shame to her. If she does wrong, she ought to feel it. She is not entirely without it, I think. I do not see much sign of it. She is playing Robin Adair at this moment, his favourite. Shortly afterwards Miss Bates, passing near the window, descried Mr. Knightley on horseback not far off. Mr. Knightley, I declare, I must speak to him if possible, just to thank him. I will not open the window here. It will give you all cold. But I can go into my mother's room, you know. I dare say he will come in when he knows who is here. Quite delightful to have you all meet so. Our little room so honoured. She was in the adjoining chamber while she still spoke, and opening the casement there, immediately called Mr. Knightley's attention, and every syllable of their conversation was as distinctly heard by the others as if it had passed within the same apartment. How do you do? How do you do? Oh, very well, I thank you. So obliged to you for the carriage last night. We were just in time. My mother just ready for us. "'Pray come in. Do come in. You will find some friends here.' So began Miss Bates, and Mr. Knightley seemed determined to be heard in his turn, for most resolutely and commandingly did he say, "'How is your niece, Miss Bates? I want to inquire after you all, but particularly your niece. How is Miss Fairfax? I hope she caught no cold last night. How is she to-day? Tell me how Miss Fairfax is.' and Miss Bates was obliged to give a direct answer before he would hear her in anything else. The listeners were amused, and Mrs. Weston gave Emma a look of particular meaning, but Emma still shook her head in steady scepticism. "'So obliged to you, so very much obliged to you for the carriage,' resumed Miss Bates. He cut her short with, "'I am going to Kingston. Can I do anything for you?' "'Oh, dear, Kingston, are you? Mrs. Cole was saying the other day she wanted something from Kingston.' "'Mrs. Cole has servants to send. Can I do anything for you?' "'No, I thank you. But do come in. Who do you think is here? Miss Woodhouse and Miss Smith. So kind as to call to hear the new pianoforte. Do put up your horse at the crown and come in.' "'Well,' said he in a deliberating manner, "'for five minutes, perhaps.' 
and here is mrs weston and frank churchill too quite delightful so many friends no not now i thank you i could not stay two minutes i must get on to kingston as fast as i can oh do come in they will be so very happy to see you no no your room is full enough i will call another day and hear the pianoforte well i am so sorry oh mr knightley what a delightful party last night and how extremely pleasant did you ever see such dancing was not it delightful miss woodhouse and mr frank churchill i never saw anything equal to it oh very delightful indeed i can say nothing less for i suppose miss woodhouse and mr frank churchill are hearing everything that passes and raising his voice still more i do not see why miss fairfax should not be mentioned too i think miss fairfax dances very well and mrs weston is the very best country dance player without exception in england now if your friends have any gratitude they will say something pretty loud about you and me in return but i cannot stay to hear it oh mr knightley one moment more something of consequence so shocked jane and i are both so shocked about the apples what is the matter now to think of your sending us all your store apples you said you had a great many and now you have not one left we really are so shocked mrs hodges may well be angry william larkins mentioned it here you should not have done it indeed you should not ah he is off he never can bear to be thanked but i thought he would have stayed now and it would have been a pity not to have mentioned well returning to the room i have not been able to succeed mr knightley cannot stop he is going to kingston he asked me if he could do anything yes said jane we heard his kind offers we heard everything oh yes my dear i dare say you might because you know the door was open and the window was open and mr knightley spoke loud you must have heard everything to be sure can i do anything for you at kingston said he so i just mentioned oh miss woodhouse must you be going you seem but just come so very obliging of you emma found it really time to be at home the visit had already lasted long and on examining watches so much of the morning was perceived to be gone that mrs weston and her companion taking leave also could allow themselves only to walk with the two young ladies to hartfield gates before they set off for randalls end of chapter ten all right so we will we will talk about miss bates and mr knightley when we get to the end, end of today's chapters that we're discussing but going back to the beginning, there's a statement that Emma makes, or that Austin has Emma think, that shows up again in a couple different places in the book, and that is perfect happiness, that phrase. Perfect happiness, even in memory, is not common. I'm just putting that out there. Keep your ears perked up for later, because it'll come up again. I also thought it was very interesting how clear Emma was in telling Harriet, I am not as good a pianist as Jane Fairfax. Don't class us together. Don't put us in that same category. She is better than me. And it's one of the times when I really do feel like Emma's not playing with humility here at all. Like she's really made uncomfortable by having Harriet praise her, possibly because other people might hear. And that would be uncomfortable because you know it's not true. But also it's just there are parts of Emma that are growing up. There are other parts of her that are not. We're going to keep seeing that. But some of the parts are. And, and there are moments like that from here on out in the book, which I love. Harriet saying, I hate Italian singing. There is no understanding a word of it. Okay, first off, that's just funny. Second off, it's hard to imagine that Jane was actually playing and singing Italian songs because Frank Churchill was joining in and singing with her, it's possible. It's not impossible, but it would mean that Frank knew a lot more about music than I think he probably does, which makes me think this is just a joke about Harriet not being particularly right when it comes to languages and how they are sung. It could be something in Latin for all that, but it was probably something in French, which would make more sense to me, at least, than Italian. Either way, Harriet wouldn't understand it. You may have heard the phrase, he came to their father upon some business, he asked him to stay dinner. This was a common phrasing. Instead of asked him to stay to dinner or stay for dinner, he just asked him to stay dinner. And that was perfectly normal. Not a misprint, not a typo, not an error. Okay, I found a reference to muslins. We've talked about muslins a dozen times in all sorts of places. 
well, it's the first time I can remember coming across a note about where the word muslin comes from. I'm going to read to you what it says in the annotation because I don't know if this is true and somebody is going to know and let us know, please. You can email heather at graplet.com or call 206-350-1642 and let us all gain from your knowledge. So here's what the annotation says. Muslin, which we know had been a popular fabric since 1780s, derives either from Mycelos, M-A-I-S-O-L-O-S, the Greek name for the Indian port of Makilipatnam, where the fabric originated, or from the Iraqi city of Mosul, which was an important point on the trading route. Neither of those rang bells for me. It could just be that like Peking and Beijing, like we now spell it sort of correctly in English, and maybe the previous explanations that I've read for where the name muslin comes from were just Englishified and incorrect, largely incorrect. But I'm now fascinated. I would love to hear somebody who knows a lot about muslin because it keeps coming up. I mean, for goodness sake, we should know. What did you think about the description of Highbury? It was much more slice of life-ish than somehow I was anticipating. The men who were coming in and out, the stray letter boy on an obstinate mule, the butcher with his tray. It's like the beginning of Beauty and the Beast. There goes his baker with the bread like always. It's the same thing, except it's in Jane Austen. And the dogs quarreling over a dirty bone, that's, that's when my brain like kicked into gear and went, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I backed up because it's like that two dogs fighting over a dirty bone does not scream Austinian reality to me. I don't know what happened. I don't know where it came from, but I love that we get this real vignette, this slice of life from the book at this point. It's, it's nice. By the way, when I talked about ginger and grassmere gingerbread cookies before, or gingerbread biscuits, in the 14th century, so this is, you know, Marco Polo, post Marco Polo, but still way early. In the 14th century, a pound of ginger cost the same as a actual sheep. You could buy a sheep with a pound of ginger or vice versa. That's some expensive vegetation is what that is. I was impressed. So there are two scenes of social politics that happen in today's chapters that I thought were fun and fascinating. One is Frank informing Mrs. Weston that she had promised to visit the Bateses. And Mrs. Weston seems not at all sure that this is correct, but she's in it for the win and so okay. And then Frank continues to try and backpedal. Well, M dash, if you advise it, M dash, parentheses, but with a smile, and parentheses, if Colonel Campbell should have employed a careless friend, and if it should prove to have been an indifferent tone, what shall I say? Like, how am I going to behave if the piano really stinks and I'm stuck? I'm no good at lying about things like this. I'm no good at lying. I'm no good at making a civil falsehood. And then Emma's response, though, I don't know how to take this. But Emma's response, I do not believe any such thing, replied Emma. I am persuaded that you can be as insincere as your neighbors when it is necessary. <laughs> you can lie like anybody when you have to, dude. You're going to be fine. Go on over to the Bateses. Tell them that the piano's nice no matter what it sounds like. I just love that. But both the civil falsehood, the idea of a civil falsehood, like in order to get along with people, especially when you're all in the same village and you have to see each other all the time, sometimes, first off, asking, do I look fat in this? It's a bad question to ask. And second off, saying, well, actually, is also not a good answer to that question. Civil falsehoods. But also, you can be as insincere as your neighbors when it's necessary. But then to add to the craziness, Mrs. Weston is like, please come with me. I really want you to come with me. I don't think I can do this if you don't come with me. I think you need to come with me. It will be felt so great an attention. And I always thought you meant it, like you meant to go with me. But then as Frank and Mr. Weston head off, 
Emma goes back inside to Harriet, trying with all the force of her own mind to convince her that if she wanted the plain muslin, it was of no use to look at figured. And figured muslin here is decorated. So if you want plain, stop looking at the decorated fabrics because you're not going to find a plain one. Okay? I just trying with all the force of her own mind to convince Harriet. Like she's not saying anything. She's just willing it so that Harriet will stop and they can leave. And I loved that. You heard about Mr. Woodhouse required us to do the dumplings three times, apple dumplings. Apple dumplings apparently at this time were boiled. I found a recipe. I'm not sure. But either way, even if you were cooking an apple dumpling, like in a pan, like a pie plate, even if you had small apple dumplings that you were cooking that way, if you put them through three times, you would wind up with apple paste, right? It would be goo. So, I mean, yes, that does make it gruel-like and probably tastier than gruel for Mr. Woodhouse. But I love that Miss Bates is like, don't tell him that we didn't do it three times, just ixnay on the elte. I also love Miss Bates. Okay. She learns about Mr. Knightley sending the last of his apples from the guy who brought them from Donwell Abbey, talking to their servant slash cook, Patty. Patty tells her, which she was expressly asked not to do. And then Miss Bates, I wanted to keep it from Jean, but unluckily I had mentioned it before I was aware. If anything sums up Miss Bates and how her brain just careens into things, unluckily, I had mentioned it before I was aware. I think I could apply that to a lot of conversations I have had in my life. I am quite certain. I will need to remember that for future reference. I also loved, and again, this is the Jane Austen telling us an awful lot about the actions that are happening when we can't actually see them was Miss Bates as they were walking up the stairs. She starts pretty simply, and you can tell that Miss Weston is the first in line. Pray take care, Mrs. Weston. There is a step at that turning. And then, pray take care, Miss Woodhouse. Ours is a rather dark staircase, rather darker and narrower than one could wish. Miss Smith, pray take care. Miss Woodhouse, I am quite concerned. I am sure you hit your foot. Miss Smith, the step at turning. It was when, Miss Woodhouse, I am quite concerned. I am sure you hit your foot. It was when I heard that that I laughed out loud because I thought, man, you could have so much fun in filming just this little scene. There's so much there to play with, especially if you're Miss Bates and you have good scene partners. It would just be, be lovely. So the Irish melodies, there's the Kramer music that we talked about before that Frank Churchill pulls out, and then a new set of Irish melodies. So there was a guy named Thomas Moore who had collections of Irish melodies. In 1812, the third volume of these Irish melodies had been published, and they were very, very popular. Frank is talking about a new set of Irish melodies. It's very possible that was the fourth volume. This guy was selling a lot. And that would have been new and new to him. However, the fact that he knows the Irish melodies means he knows the previous volumes most likely. And that is why he's able to point out she's playing Robin Adair at this moment, his favorite. And his is in italics. Leaving Emma to think, ah, Mr. Dixon's favorite. I understand. I am linking out for you to several different versions of Robin Adair. And if we can find one that is not copy protected, maybe we can play that out at the end of today's episode. It is a lovely song and it has a, a really, well, it sounds from the song like it's going to have a really melancholy history because it's very sad. It's what's this dull town to me? Robin's not near. What was I wish to see? What wish to hear? Where's all the joy and made this town heaven on earth? Oh, they're all fled with thee. Robin Adair. And it's all about being so lonely because this guy Robin isn't there. And it turns out she wrote it when she was in Bath. This lovely young lady, Lady Carolyn Keppel, 
married, eventually married, but she fell in love with an Irish surgeon, Robin Adair, and her parents forbid her from seeing him at all. And chaos ensues. Eventually, they were able to marry. It all ended happily, although she did die after having their third child. But he never remarried. And this song just kept going. And it is still out there. And in fact, when I was looking for a song version on YouTube to share with you, the other thing I found was a really goofy woman and her husband dressed in Regency costume discussing their 1812 Broadwood square piano that she is playing on. And she plays some tunes that were in the Austin playbook. And that's how Robin Adair was one of the things that they talk about. But the the whole provenance of the the piano that she has right there next to her is very silly. They're very silly. He's got a newspaper open in front of him, and it's because the script is on the inside of the newspaper. So it's very cheese ball, but it's very sweet. And you get to hear the piano, which is marvelous. It really sounded quite good, which I mean, they're the best pianos being played at the time, so or being made at the time. So it's not a huge surprise, I guess. I love that once they're all inside, Miss Bates sees Mr. Knightley through the window, flings the window open, leans out, and of course, she can speak very loudly, so everybody can hear her on the inside and probably on the street. But we also know that Mr. Knightley can speak very loudly to Miss Bates because Emma told us in the previous chapter. It'd be horrible for him to have her around Donwell Abbey all the time. Although, honestly, if she were there, he would just speak louder to get her to stop. Well, here we go. Because she immediately called Mr. Knightley's attention, and every syllable of their conversation was as distinctly heard by the others as if it had passed within the same apartment. And then Mr. Knightley, being a polite gentleman, how is your niece, Miss Bates? I want to inquire after you all, but particularly your niece. How is Miss Fairfax? I hope she caught no cold last night. How is she today? Tell me how Miss Fairfax is. Now, this means Mrs. Weston thinks, ah, I was right. And Emma's like, forget it. Not true. But Miss Bates was obliged to give a direct answer before he would hear anything else. So she's trying to say something else. And he's like, nah, 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 nah. How's Miss Fairfax? Let me know that first. So everybody thought that was funny. And then she begs him to come in and he says, well, for five minutes, perhaps. And here's Miss Weston and Mr. Frank Churchill, too. Quite delightful. So many friends. Everybody's going to come up to their very small sitting room. And then Knightley, seeing Frank, says, no, not now. I thank you. I could not stay two minutes. I must get to Kingston as fast as I can. Oh, please do come. They'll be so happy to see you. No, no. Really? Your room is full enough. I'll call another day and I'll hear the pianoforte. Oh, well, I'm so sorry. And then immediately jumps into discussing the dancing. So it's like he was almost off the phone. And then she started a new conversation. She asked a new question and you can't get off the phone now. And then Knightley's response to her changing the subject is to cut her off and say, Oh, it was very delightful indeed. I can say nothing less, for I suppose Miss Woodhouse and Mr. Frank Churchill are hearing everything that passes. And, in parentheses, raising his voice still more, I do not see why Miss Fairfax should not be mentioned too. I think Miss Fairfax dances very well. It's like, stop praising Emma so much. She's not the only pretty girl in town, and she's certainly not the most skilled. So let's give Jane who does not have all the benefits that Emma has. Let's give her some, some traction here. And then Knightley ends that paragraph with, Now if your friends have any gratitude, they will say something pretty loud about you and me in return. But I cannot stay to hear it. And she's like, oh, something of consequence. So shocked. Jane and I were just shocked to see about the apples. What's the matter now? You can tell he's like on his way away. The horse's head is turned. He's almost out of there. What's the matter now? Oh, to think you sending us all those apples. You said you had so great many, and now you have not one left. Mr. William Larkins mentioned it here. You should not have done it. Indeed, you should not. Ah, uh, he is off. He can never bear to be thanked. But I thought he would have stayed now. 
and it would have been a pity not to have mentioned, well, and then in parentheses, returning to the room, I have not been able to succeed. Mr. Knightley cannot stop. He is going to Kingston. He asked me if he could do anything. And then they start cutting her off. Yes, says Jane. We heard his kind offers. We heard everything. Two words, every thing. And then by the end of the next paragraph, as Miss Bates continues on, oh, Miss Woodhouse, must you be going? You seem to just come so very obliging of you. And before she could get stuck onto another, another new conversation topic, they managed to escape. And Mrs. Weston and her companion taking leave also could allow themselves only to walk with the two young ladies to the Hartfield Gates before they set off to Randall's. They, Emma's leaving and we have to. We just have to go. Sorry, thanks. Piano's lovely. Happy to hear about the apples. Bye-bye. And that's the end of our chapters for today. I just love that so much. Ah, uh, that's just some fabulous fancy writing that makes me very happy. All right, I'm going to go lie down. You have a great week. Don't forget, you still have a few hours to jump on the raffle if you are interested in winning the Author Clock, Volume 1 because it is time. Again, we'll, we'll be choosing a, a winner for that raffle at the end of the month. Options close midnight June 30th, and then I'll contact you and we'll, we'll get you your clock that you won. All right. Have a great week. I will talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that craftlit lives. It's, it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome. Makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before, but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.